Hello everyone, I'm Diglo Buffalo, and I'd like to welcome you to a new Let's Play series. Uh, this time we're going to play The Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy by Infocom from 1984. So, uh, well, without much further ado, let's get right into the game. So we start off in darkness. You wake up. The room is spinning very gently around your head. Or at least, it would be if you could see it, which you can't. It is pitch black. All right, well, first thing we generally do when it's dark, we turn on light. Good start to the day. Pity it's going to be the worst one of your life. The light is now on, bedroom, in the bed. The bedroom is a mess. It is a small bedroom with a faded carpet and old wallpaper. There is a wash basin, a chair with a tatty dressing gown slung over it, and a window with the curtains drawn. Near the exit leading south is a phone. There is a flathead screwdriver here outside the bed. There is a toothbrush here outside the bed. So I guess with all this outside the bed business, the game is trying to tell us something. So why don't we get, whoops, get out of bed. One thing I want to mention here is that my microphone is obscuring most of my keyboard, so I'm typing blind and I'm not very good at that. So you're going to see me make a lot of mistakes. All right. Very difficult, but you manage it. The room is still spinning. It dips and sways a little. Okay. Well, let's try and take... Take... That screwdriver. That sounds like something that would be useful to an adventurer like us. It slips through your fumbling fingers and hits the carpet with a nerve-shattering bang. Okay, nerve-shattering bang of a screwdriver falling onto a carpet. And the room is spinning, so I'm going to deduce from this that we're not drunk, but hungover. Well, actually, usually the first thing you want to do after getting up, maybe, is getting dressed. So, let's take the dressing gown. Luckily, this is large enough for you to get a hold of. You notice something in the pocket. So, let's look in pocket. It's hard to open or close the pocket unless you're wearing the gown. Is it really? I've looked through my pockets often enough while not wearing a jacket or whatever else. But, this is an adventure game, so it works by its own rules. So we wear a gown. You're now wearing your gown. So now, please, can we look in pocket? Opening your gown reveals a buffered analgesic, pocket fluff, and a thing your aunt gave you, which you don't know what it is. Okay. Well, the analgesic actually sounds pretty good when you're having... or a minor case of hangover. So, you swallow the tablet. After a few seconds, the room begins to calm down and behave in an orderly manner. Your terrible headache goes. Well, that's good. And we have pocket fluff, which um, will be important later on. And a thing our aunt gave us, which will also be important later on and very useful later on, actually. So, uh, we got the gown. Let's get the screwdriver. Not, there is no nine in screwdriver. Taken. If I learned something in school, then, then that, that there's no nine in screwdriver. So, we yeah. got... Uh, I'm sorry, I'm way off here. Toothbrush. As you pick up the toothbrush, a tree outside the window collapses. There is no causal relationship between these two events. Fair enough. Let's open the drapes. Is, it, is this game going to understand drapes? I don't know drapes. Let's open... Hold on. Let's see. Small bedroom, wash basin window with the curtains drawn. So let's open... Curtains. With an eye, please. Ugh. As you part your curtains, you see that it's a bright morning. The sun is shining, the birds are singing, the meadows are blooming, and a large yellow bulldozer is advancing on your home. That's always a great way to start your morning. So let's go south. 
front porch. This is the enclosed front porch of your home. Your front garden lies to the south, and you can re-enter your home to the north. On the doormat is a pile of junk mail. Well, usually the last thing you want to do ever in life is take junk mail, but since this is an adventure game, it means take everything that is nailed down. So, let's take the mail and continue south. Front of house. You can enter your home to the north. A path leads around it to the northeast and northwest, and a country lane is visible to the south. All that lies between your home and the huge yellow bulldozer bearing down on it is a few yards of mud. Mr. Prosser from the local council is standing on the other side of the bulldozer. He seems to be wearing a digital watch. He looks startled to see you emerge and yells at you to get out of the way. The bulldozer rumbles slowly towards your home. Well, we're the only thing standing between our home and this bulldozer, so getting out of the way is maybe not the best idea. The bulldozer rumbles slowly towards your home. Well, of course, uh, the next thing is something that is much easier to figure out if you've actually read the book, The Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. But, uh, well, if you don't want the bulldozer to knock your house down, you have to keep standing between it and your house. Or better, not stand between it, but to lie down in front of it. You lie down in the path of the advancing bulldozer. Prosser yells at you to, for Christ's sake, move. And now, we wait. Time passes. The bulldozer thunders towards you. The ground is shaking beneath you as you lie in the mud. Let's wait some more. Time passes. The noise of the giant bulldozer is now so violently loud that you can't even hear Prosser yelling to warn you that you will be killed if you don't get the hell out of the way. You just seem gesticulating wildly. Fair enough, let's keep waiting. Time passes. With the terrible grinding of gears, the bulldozer comes to an abrupt halt just in front of you. It shakes, shudders, and emits noxious substances all over your rosebed. Prosser is incoherent with rage. Moments later, your friend, Fort Prefect, arrives. He hardly seems to notice your predicament, but keeps glancing nervously at the sky. He says, hello, Arthur, and takes a towel from his battered leather satchel and offers it to you. Well... But Ford, what about my house? It's not a house, it's a home. Footnote 2. Ford glances uncomfortably at the sky. He offers you the towel again. Well, here we have a game. Come on. With footnotes. Let's see footnote 2. Bob Dylan, 1969. Well, we learned something new there. So let's try it their way. Ford. What about my home? Fort looks startled, then guilty. He starts to say something and stops. He starts to say something else and stops. Suddenly, he seems to see the bulldozer for the first time. He stops starting to say things and starts. He seems to come to a momentous decision, says he has something of earth-shattering importance to tell you, and stresses the importance of a quick drink at the horse and groom. Pointing towards Prosser, you exclaim, But that man wants to knock my house down. Ford goes off for a quiet word with Prosser. From where you're lying, you cannot hear what's happening, although they seem deeply engrossed in conversation. A second ago, it says it's not a house, it's a home. Now, it's suddenly, it's a house again. But, you know, I'm sure they'll have it their way. So let's wait some more. We're actually doing a lot of waiting here in the beginning of the game. Time passes. Ford and Prosser stop talking and approach you. Ford says the Prosser has agreed to lie in your place so that the two of you can go off to the pub. Reluctantly, Prosser steps forward and lies down in front of the bulldozer. You stand up. Okay. So first, let's take that towel that Ford was offering us and let's head on south. Country Lane. The road runs from your home to the north towards the village pub to the west. Ford enters from the north. Well, let's go west then. Okay, so we went west. Pub. The pub is pleasant and cheerful and full of pleasant and cheerful people who don't know they've got about 12 minutes to live and are therefore having a spot of lunch. Some music is playing on the old jukebox. The exit is east. 
There's a barman serving at the bar. Behind the bar is a shelf. It is full of the sort of items you find on shelves behind bars in pubs. Fort hurries after you. So let's look at the shelf. Come on. On the shelf, behind the bar, is the usual array of bottles, glasses, and soggy beer mats, some packets of peanuts, and a plate of uninviting cheese sandwiches. Ford buys lots of beer and offers half to you. Muscle relaxant, he says impenetrably. Well, if we're gonna <clears throat> drink a lot of beer, why not also have a spot of lunch ourselves? Let's buy a sandwich. The barman gives you a cheese sandwich. The bread is like the stuff that stereo is compact in. The cheese would be great for rubbing out spelling mistakes. And margarine and pickle have performed an unidentifying chemical reaction that produced something that shouldn't be, but is, turquoise. Very nice. Since it is clearly unfit for human consumption, you're grateful to be charged only a pound for it. Drink the beer, urges Ford. It will help cushion your system against the coming shock of matter transference beam. Okay. So let's drink beer. It's very good beer, brewed by a small local company. You particularly like its flavor, which is why you woke up feeling so wretched this morning. You were at somebody's birthday party here in the pub last night. You begin to relax and enjoy yourself. So when Ford mentions that he's from a small planet in the vicinity of Beetlejuice, not from Guildford, as he usually claims, you take it in stride and say, oh yes, which part? Let's drink some more beer. It's always a good thing to do. It is really very pleasant stuff with a very good dry nutty flavor, some light froth on top and a deep color. It is at exactly room temperature. Beer at room temperature, how very British. You reflect that the world cannot be all bad when there are such pleasures in it. Ford mentions that the world is going to end in about 12 minutes. Okay, that doesn't sound very good. Let's drink some more beer. There is a distant crash, which Ford explains is nothing to worry about. Probably just your house being knocked down. Our house? Let's go back outside. You see the huge bulldozer heaving itself among the cloud of brick dust, which is all that remains of your home. As you start up the lane, a small dog runs up to you, yapping. Ford hurries after you. Let's look at... dog. The mongrel looks hungry. Well, we've got something to eat, so let's give sandwich to dog, since we were not going to eat it ourselves anyway. The dog is deeply moved. With powerful sweeps of its tail, it indicates that it regards this cheese sandwich as one of the great cheese sandwiches. Nine out of ten pet owners could happen by at this point expressing any preference they please, but this dog would spurn both them and all their tins. This is a dog which has met its main sandwich. It eats with passion and ignores a passing microscopic space fleet. Fair enough, let's keep going north. You reach the site of what was your home. It is now a pile of rubble. Mr. Prosser looks sheepishly triumphant. A trick a few people can do, as it requires a lot of technically complex deltoid muscle work. Front of house. Mr. Prosser, from the local council, is standing on the other side of the bulldozer. He seems to be wearing a digital watch. Ford hurries after you. Well... Look at house. It is now a pile of rubble. Hmm. Let's yell at Prosser. You begin to get a sore throat. With a noise like a cross between Led Zeppelin's farewell concert and the eruption of Krakatoa, a huge fleet of Vogan construction ships flies overhead and announces that the Earth will be demolished to make way for a new hyperspace bypass in two of your Earth minutes. In all the turmoil, you drop the thing that your aunt gave you, which you don't know what it is, and it rolls away. It is the least of your worries. Anyway, you've been trying to get rid of it for years. So, look at... Come on, Vogan. Fleet! 
The fleet consists of a terrifying number of huge, ugly yellow ships, all scarred with the result of many such past demolition jobs. Chicago's John Hancock Tower, knocked about a bit and painted yellow, is what they each look like. This is knocked about a bit, painted yellow, and flying. The vast yellow ships thunder across the sky, spreading waves of terror and panic in their wake. The voice of the Vogan captain slams across the country, insisting that the planning charts and, and demolition orders have been available at the local planning office in Alpha Centauri for 50 years, and it's too late to start making a fuss about it now. Throughout the noise, Ford is shouting at you. He removes a small black device from his satchel, but accidentally drops it at your feet. So let's take device taken. Fierce gales whip across the land and thunder banks continuously through the air in the wake of the giant ships. Ford fights to reach you, but the wind is too fierce. Further announcements from the Vogan captain make it clear that the militia will begin in just a few seconds. Through the blinding rain, you see lights flickering on the small device. So let's see. Examine... Device. The electronic sub-ether signaling device is shaped like a small fist with an extended thumb. Various lights along its knuckles are currently blinking wildly, indicating a spaceship in the vicinity. It has two small buttons, a red one labeled Call Engineer and a green one labeled Hitchhike. It bears a small label which reads, Another fine product of the Sirius Cybernetics Corporation. Affixed to the thumb is a lifetime guarantee. So. Let's press the green button. Light swirl sickeningly around your head. The ground arches away beneath your feet and every atom of your being is scrambled. An experience you're probably going to have to get used to. You're in dark. Okay. So, first of all, let's save our game. And, well, I think I'm going to end this video here, so... I'll thank you for watching, and I'll see you in the next part. So until then, have a good one.